Tell me, how many of you talk to yourselves? Just raise your hands if you do. Uh-huh. I saw a lady in the back over there going, I don't know, do I talk to myself? What was that I was saying? <laughs> I always want to ask because I talk to myself. I, I say some pretty crazy things to myself, but I realize over my life, I've said crazy things to myself as well as to other people. I've said some weird things like, the way I used to introduce myself when I was really young. But I heard that word, underprivileged. Now I was eight and I thought, whoa, that sounds pretty serious. That sounds pretty important, underprivileged. I think I'm gonna go around and tell people I'm Charlotte and I'm underprivileged. <laughs> and we'd be somewhere else at church, hi, I'm Charlotte, and did you know I'm underprivileged? And they kind of look at me and go, ooh, sick. And I go, hey, I'm Charlotte and I'm underprivileged. And, and, and I did that. Then I started to get an attitude. Yeah, I'm underprivileged. So I kept introducing myself that way. Continued until I was in the ninth grade at Lincoln Junior High in Minneapolis. And I encountered Miss Gracie Hunter. Miss Gracie Hunter was the ninth grade English teacher at Lincoln Junior High. And back then, Lincoln, uh, the junior highs ran through ninth grade and then you did 10th, 11th, and 12th at the senior high school. And so you couldn't get out of Lincoln until you had been through Miss Hunter's English class. It's my mom and the five of us. Sometimes the lights get disconnected. Sometimes the heat is turned off and it's cold at our place. Do you know what that's like? And that government cheese everybody jokes about, we eat that. That's a regular staple at our house. And I went on and on and on, and she said, I really don't care. She said, my father left us as well. A lot of people eat the cheese. She said, Charlotte, you've been using it as a crutch. Yeah, she said, a lot of people eat that cheese. She said, I have some, it's good, don't worry about it. And you're putting this out there so people can feel sorry for you. So people can say, ah, I don't expect anything of her. I don't expect a thing, look. Look how pitiful she is. And she said, today, this is the last day that you say, I'm Charlotte McGregor and I'm underprivileged. Do you understand me? But here's, here's what I finally learned. And Don had given me the answer. He said, what do you bring to the table? It's not your stuff. He said, it's you. You bring you to the table. I was bringing, I've got spreadsheets, I've got PowerPoint, I've got some incentive programs, we'll give you more money, your stuff is crap, I've got these lines, I've got all these kinds of things. But the key was, I was bringing me to the table. I had to bring me to the table. And then he had also said, it's the choices you make, Charlotte. You chose wrong that particular morning. And what I finally understood was, in asking this question of myself, Charlotte, who are you? It came down to this. I am the sum total of choices that I've made throughout my life. So that meeting with Don Shaughness of National City Bank back that day, 20 plus years ago, when he said to me, what do you bring to the table? That set me on this course of really trying to understand what it was that I had to bring to the table to be effective in my life, personally and professionally. I really went on a, a, a journey to understand what effective people bring to the table and that's something else Don taught me. There are effective people and there are ineffective. Ineffective people say, I don't have any choices. I don't have choices. They ask questions like this. Well, when are we gonna get some more money to do what we need to do? How come they haven't given us all that we need to do what I need to do, et cetera. It's always outward bound. Effective people say things like this. What can I do to help you? What can I do to improve this situation? It is very much based on an inward, there's an action that's associated with that. Effective people choose their tood. And I'll tell you more about that, choose their tood. Secondly, effective people are pulled by their passion. Effective people are, choose, are pulled by their passion. Thirdly, effective people are remarkable. They choose to be remarkable. And then lastly, effective people choose to be servant leaders. So it was a big deal for me to go to college. So I left to go to college and my brother next to me, his name is James, he decided uh, the very next year he was going to college as well. And James set off to Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. 
Uh, the weekend before school was to start, we drove him down to Ames, dropped him off, got him all situated. And James lived in an apartment with four other guys. James, on that Monday morning, was back at our doorstep in Minneapolis. Ding dong. And we all peered through the window, and there's James. And he's got all his stuff. And my other younger brother's mad. No, you're not coming back in. I already got your room, dude. You can't come back in. So we open the door and just say, James, what's going on? And he said, you know what? I had a revelation this weekend. What I care about is being a musician. That's all I want to do is play the drums, sing. Just that's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. So I decided to leave. I hitched a ride back home, and I'm here, and I'm going to be a musician. <laughs> so we all go, OK, great. We're leaving. So you get it figured out. We'll see you later. James then set on this course of becoming a musician. Now, if you've been to Minneapolis or heard of Minneapolis, you know about this little guy about this tall who wears uh, high heels. His name is Prince. And James decided, I'm going to go out to Prince's studio, and I'm just going to hang out there. And that's my plan, to become a musician and to become well-known. And we all thought, bad plan, James. That's not going to work. But that's what James did every day. So that went on for some time. And James uh, said, you know what, Charlotte, I just want to be here because one day Prince might notice me. And then one day Prince had a run-in with his drummer, and they were about to go on the road to Europe. And so he said, James, you tech and you drum, right? Yeah, I do. Well, pack your stuff. We're going on the road. Well, then I get a call one night. It's about 3 in the morning. You know, you don't like to get those calls real early in the morning. You think something's wrong. But it's James, and it's really noisy in the background. And I say, what's going on? And what's happening? He said, oh, I just wanted to call. I'm here in Wembley Stadium with Paul McCartney and, like, uh, Elton John. We're just kicking it. We're just hanging out. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm thinking, my God, my brother, he's a musician. He's made a living. He's put a daughter through college, built homes, done all kinds of things. And I'll, I just say this to, to put it into perspective. Remember, we grew up in the projects, five kids. He dropped out of college. Here's my point. James had a passion to be a musician. Didn't matter what it took. Didn't matter what people thought. If they agreed or disagreed, he wanted to be a musician. How about you? What's your passion? And are you being pulled by that?